Good morning. Welcome to God's house for our worship of the triune God. We call today in the church here, in the season of end times, the Sunday of last judgment. Our thoughts turn to that last day when Christ will appear in glory and judge all people. By the grace of God, we know our judgment, not guilty of sin, because Christ died for us. We are comforted in that fact this morning and also encouraged to use our gifts as we wait for Jesus to come again. We will follow the order of service, service of the word, page 38 in the front of our hymn book. Just one note, one concerned member noticed that somebody left their lights on, a silver Buick LeSabre, if that's your car, maybe you want to go and check it out before we get into worship this morning. We will open with the first hymn, number 230, Lord Jesus Christ be present now. Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord.
Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, so rule and govern our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit that we may always look forward to the end of this present evil age and to the day of your righteous judgment. Keep us steadfast in true and living faith and present us at last holy and blameless before you. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. The first lesson from God's Word for our consideration today takes us to the Old Testament ministry of Jeremiah the prophet, an occasion when Jeremiah had to speak about God's upcoming judgment to his fellow people of Israel who were impenitent, who were hardened in their sin. The judgment that he spoke is one that we should take to heart too because if we would lose our faith, at the end we would only face the Lord's righteous judgment. Early in the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came from the Lord. This is what the Lord says. Stand in the courtyard of the Lord's house and speak to all the people of the towns of Judah who come to worship in the house of the Lord. Tell them everything I command you. Do not omit a word. Perhaps they will listen and each will turn from his evil way. Then I will relent and not bring on them the disaster I was planning because of the evil they have done. Say to them, this is what the Lord says. If you do not listen to me and follow my law which I have set before you, and if you do not listen to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I have sent to you again and again, though you have not listened, then I will make this house like Shiloh and this city an object of cursing among all the nations of the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Together we sing the Psalm of the Day, Psalm 90, written by Moses. It is a reflection on the shortness of life and our need to always be ready for the second coming of Jesus and the final judgment. It is printed out on page 99. We'll sing the psalm in unison.
The second lesson is found in the Apostle Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians chapter 1. He gives comfort to Christians of every age as he reminds us that when Christ comes again, he will judge all those who are opposed to him, but bring rescue for all of us who have believed in him. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right, and as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power. On the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you, because you believed our testimony to you. This is the word of the Lord. We sing the verse of the day. Let's all stand for the reading of the Gospel lesson. The lesson from the Gospel of Luke is also the basis for the sermon. While they were listening to this, Jesus went on to tell them a parable. Because he was near Jerusalem, and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, A man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king, and then to return. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten minas. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, Sir, your mina has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied. Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your mina has earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your mina. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow. Why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I could have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, Take his mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. Sir, they said, he already has ten. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what he has will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who do not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. This is the gospel lesson of our Lord. You may be seated, children. You're invited to come up to the front for the children's message. Morning, Carter. Come on up. Hi. Hi. So today, we are talking about Judgment Day, the day that Jesus is going to return 
and take us all to be with him in heaven. This is a calendar. This is a calendar that my sister-in-law gives to us every Christmas. And in it, there are all kinds of funny pictures for our family. But more importantly, in it are all the days marked for all the birthdays for our grandpas and grandmas, nieces and nephews. So that way, we'll never miss a birthday, right? So when we know a birthday is coming up, we can prepare. We can get a present. We can send a card. But when we know something is coming then we can be prepared for it. That's why the calendar is so important. Now, in this calendar has all the important dates for my family. And yet, as I look at this calendar, you know what I can't find on here? Nowhere can I find it marked when Jesus is going to come back. It's an important thing, right? Well, why isn't it marked on my calendar then? Because we don't know when he's going to come. Jesus has just told us he is coming back. Well, the important thing of knowing when something is coming is to prepare for it. So if we don't know when Jesus is coming, how will we be prepared? How should we be prepared? The Bible tells us we should be prepared every day. And here's how we prepare for Jesus' coming. We confess our sins. We believe that Jesus died to take away all of our sins, and we stay connected to his word. We keep hearing about Jesus' love for us. We keep believing it. And that way, when Jesus returns, even though we don't know when, he will find us ready and prepared, and then he'll take us to be with him in heaven. Let's pray and ask Jesus to help us be prepared for when he comes. We pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for taking away our many sins. You are a good and merciful Savior. Lord, we know that you will come again one day, and so we ask ask you to help us be prepared to always be believing and trusting in you and hearing your word until that day when you take us to be with you in heaven. In your name we pray. Amen.
Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Savior Jesus Christ. Let's consider our gospel lesson for today taken from Luke's Gospel chapter 19. Friends, today the gospel lesson encourages us to think about a day that every single human being will experience together, whether he wants to or not. That's Judgment Day. It's the day when our Lord Jesus will return in all his kingly glory and he will take us to be with him in heaven. Today, as our text begins, Jesus is walking to Jerusalem and he's surrounded by a group of people. Now, not everybody in this group believes that Jesus is the Savior, but everybody in this group is hoping that as soon as Jesus gets to Jerusalem, he will set up this glorious kingdom of God here on earth. It's like they were hoping that Jesus was going to head into Jerusalem, kick out those nasty Romans, and then set up a divine rule here on earth. And of course, all those who are with him would be treat, rewarded well for being with him on this momentous occasion. But Jesus knew that's not what was going to happen. He knew that when he entered Jerusalem for this last time, he would be betrayed. He'd be handed over to the Romans. He'd be crucified. And there he would suffer the wrath of God for the sins of the world. He would die, be placed in a tomb, but then rise again and ascend into heaven. And then, after ascending into heaven, a day would come when he would return in all of his glory to bring judgment on unbelievers and deliverance to his people. Knowing that that was going to happen, and knowing the false ideas of those with him in the crowd, Jesus told them a parable. And Jesus tells a parable that drives home this main point. The glorious kingdom of God is not going to come at once when he enters Jerusalem. Instead, believers are not to wait around, waiting for a life of luxury and ease. They are to be serving Jesus faithfully until he comes again. And what this parable teaches you and me today is that until Jesus returns, we are to be busy using what the king gave us, both for ourselves and for others. The parable that Jesus tells begins, A man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. Now I'm struck how well the details in this parable match up with Jesus' life. And that's not always the case in parables. Usually in a parable there's one main point of comparison. And all the de other details we put shouldn't push too hard because they may or may not work. But in this parable, Jesus is obviously the man of noble birth who goes to be crowned king. And he does have noble birth, doesn't he? He has royal blood. The family line of David is flowing through his veins. But even on top of royal blood, Jesus has divine blood. He's the Son of God. And in the parable, Jesus says that this man of noble birth is going to be crowned king. Now, it would be understandable if some people in that crowd, wanting the kingdom of God to appear at once, were to misunderstand that detail. It would be easy for, the, for them to think that Jesus came down from heaven to be crowned as king here on earth. But the opposite is actually true. Even though Jesus is always our divine king, when he came down from heaven, he took off his crown. He did not make use of all his kingly rights and authority. Instead, he became like a servant. And of course, he did that to save you and me. And so the scriptures tell us that after Jesus suffered the agony of the cross, died, and then rose again, it was then a time for him to ascend into heaven to pick up that crown and wear it once again as king over all. And the Apostle Paul talks about Jesus going to be crowned 
as he ascends in his letter to the Ephesians. Listen to how Paul describes it in Ephesians chapter 1. He writes, God raised him, that's Christ, from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So scripture tells us that Jesus is now king over everything for us, the church. But there are people who still to this day do not recognize or accept the kingship of Jesus. And Jesus knew that was going to be the case. He even mentions it in our parable for today. Did you catch it? He mentions it with this one little verse. He said, But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, We don't want this man to be our king. But before that happened, the man who was going to be crowned king called his servants to himself. And the parable says, He called his ten servants and gave them ten minas. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. The king gave to each one of his servants a mina. A mina is about three months' worth of work. So it's a, a significant amount of money. And he tells them, now I give you this money, do something with it. Put it to work for me. Dear friends, servants of the one who has been crowned king and will one day return, what is the mina that the Lord has given to you? What is that mina that the Lord has given to you? I'd like you to think for a minute about all the different gifts and abilities God has given to you. He's probably given you more than one. In our stewardship meetings in October, we asked you to think about your gifts and abilities and think about how you might use them in service to Jesus. How are you doing with that, by the way? God has given to his believers many different and varied gifts. No two are the same. And yet here's an interesting detail in this parable. When the king calls forward his servants, he gives to each servant the same thing. One mina. And it's that detail that has led many commentators to say that this mina that the king gives out is really the gospel. The mina is the gospel, the good news of Jesus found in word and sacrament. That is the one thing that every believer has. That is the one thing that every believer knows. That is the one thing that every believer has been asked to use continuously and faithfully until Jesus returns, both for himself and for others. Because Jesus has commissioned us, saying, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. I'd like you then to give some thought to what that means then, that the mina is the gospel that we have been given. And what does it mean for us to put that gospel message to work? What's that look like in your life or in the life of others? Give some thought to that because we'll return to that thought. But as the parable continues, this man who went off and was crowned king comes back. And when he returns, he calls his servants to find out what they did with the money he gave them. And really the servants can be divided into two groups. The first group is made up of those servants who were diligent and faithful in the use of the money that the king gave them. And they came back and they gave even more money back to the king. And the king rewarded them for their faithfulness. The other group is that man who was unfaithful and not diligent with what the king gave him. Instead, he hid it away in a piece of cloth. 
you ever wonder why the first group was so successful with the money the king gave them? Do you ever wonder why they did what they did? What was their motivation? I'm going to go out on a limb. It's not too far of a limb. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that the first group did what they did because they loved and trusted their king. And I'll say that because when you look at their actions, there is a stark contrast between the actions of those who were faithful with those of the one who despised the king. See, the scripture tells us that for that unfaithful servant, we know how he felt about the king. Because he said to the king, I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and you reap what you did not sow. That servant cared nothing for his master. He did not respect his master's command to take that money and to put it to work. Now, sure, he offered reasons why he didn't, but all of those things were just excuses. Excuses which illuminates the real problem. And that's that he despised his master. You're a hard man. He didn't believe that the master was kind, but rather cruel. He didn't think the master was fair, but he thought he was unjust. Really, there is no difference between how that servant felt about his master when you compare it to those citizens who went ahead of the king to say, we don't want this man to be our king. And when the king heard what this unfaithful servant had to say, he said to him, you wicked servant. Friends, there will be people who appear to be servants of Jesus, servants of the king. And they have been entrusted with the gospel message, and yet they will not be uh, diligent or faithful in the use of that gift. Such a servant might say something like, you know, I don't, I don't really study the Bible or read it. Be, I don't know. I just don't have time. And I was confirmed once. You know, even though communion, the sacrament is offered at the church on a regular basis, I, I don't know. It, I don't really need it. I don't find it benefits me at all. You know, I've never told anyone about the good news of Jesus, but I don't think I really have to. I mean, after all, I know it. Those might be things that an unfaithful servant might think or say. And friends, the sad reality is we're right there with them. That if we're all honest about it with ourselves, we all at some point in our lives have failed to be perfectly diligent and faithful with the good news of Jesus that has been given to us. Either we didn't use it for ourselves or we didn't share it with others. And what we deserve to hear, what we deserve to have happen, is have Jesus return from heaven and say to us, you wicked servants. But let me tell you why you're not going to hear that. You won't hear that because you have a king who loves you. You have a king who's good and kind. You have a king who came down from heaven and took off his crown. Instead became a servant. For us. And as a servant, this king used faithfully and diligently whatever God gave him in service to the Lord. And he earned a lot of credit. He he had a lot of return for what he did with what God gave him. And yet he gives that to you and me so we can stand with it as we stand before the king. Or to use the imagery of the text, It's as if Jesus, before he calls us to stand before him, he finds the mina that we had laid away in that piece of cloth and he puts ten more in there for us. So that as we stand before him, we are seen as faithful servants. Because through faith in Christ, not only are all of our sins forgiven, gone in God's sight, but we are also credited with Christ's righteousness. So we are not wicked lazy servants. Not anymore. Not in God's sight. Because Jesus has forgiven us. 
And not only that, Jesus has also sent us out again. He's continued to give us that gospel message, and he says, put it to work for yourself and for others. Hearing Jesus' words then, we make, every, we make use of every opportunity we have to surround ourselves with that gospel message. Every time it's preached, we take advantage of that opportunity. Every time that there is a way to study the scriptures privately or together, we take advantage of that opportunity. Every time we have an opportunity to bring our children to hear the Word of God, whether it's through children's sermons or Sunday school or our school, we take advantage of that opportunity. Every time we have the opportunity to lean over the fence and talk to our neighbor about God's love for us in Christ, we pray for boldness to take advantage of that opportunity. And why do we do it? We do it because we have faith. Because we have love and trust for our king. We believe that our king is good and kind and gracious. And we want others to know about our king's love. So that they too become his servants. And the reason why we want others to become servants of that king is because we're aware that one day the king will return. Jesus is coming back. And on that day... Jesus will say to every believer, well done, my good servants. And he'll reward us with heaven. He'll take us to be with him in heaven. And of course, the evidence of that faith is found in the diligent and faithful use of his word. But on that day, he'll also say to unbelievers, you wicked servants, depart from me to the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And of course, the evidence for their unbelief is found in the neglect and the misuse of that gospel message. Thinking about that last day is certainly a sobering reality. And it reminds us that there is something that is most important for us to do right now. And that is to make use of what the King gave us. It is so important for us to continue to hear the good news that our sins are forgiven in Christ, to believe that for ourselves, and to share that good news with others. So may God graciously strengthen us so that we keep making use of what the King gave us until Jesus re returns and we hear him welcome us into our eternal home saying, Well done, my good servants. Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue by confessing our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. We confess, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We continue by giving our offerings to the Lord. Also, please take a moment to fill out the friendship register and pass that down to the person next to you in the pew. We stand to pray. Lord, you love the cheerful giver who with open heart and hand 
Blesses freely as a river that refreshes all the land. Grant us then the grace of giving with a spirit large and true that our life and all our living we may consecrate to you. Blessed by you with gifts and graces, may we heed your spirit's call. Gladly in all times and places give to you who gives us all. You have bought us, now no longer can we claim to be our own. Ever free and ever stronger, we shall serve you, Lord, alone. Amen. Included with our prayers in light of Judgment Day are these special prayers. We pray for our fellow believer Richard Neubauer, who is currently hospitalized in Watertown. We have a prayer on the occasion of Veterans Day, thanking God for our veterans, asking him to strengthen and support those who are serving. And we also have a prayer of thanksgiving on behalf of Dale and Nancy Zastro, who are marking their 43rd wedding anniversary. Let us pray. Jesus Christ, God and Lord, we confess with sorrow that we have sinned and deserve only your anger and punishment. We confess with joy that your unfailing love has redeemed us. Our hope is in you and in your full redemption. As the last judgment comes closer every day, fill us with certainty from the gospel that we are already judged not guilty through your merits and death. Calm our uneasiness and fears with the full forgiveness of sins we have because of your love and grace. Keep us faithful to your word. Send your spirit to strengthen our faith so that we are always prepared for your return as judge. Give us faithful hearts to use the time, talents, and treasures with which you have blessed us. Fill us with joy as we use what you have given us to honor you and to serve our neighbor. Make us eager to share your word and cause many more to put their hope in you before the end comes. Compassionate Savior, watch over our fellow believer Richard Neubauer during his hospitalization. Provide wisdom to doctors and hospital staff as they care for him, and bring relief for his physical needs. According to your wisdom, improve Dick's health so that he might leave the hospital soon. Above all, preserve him in the Christian faith through your powerful gospel promises. Lord of the nations, as our nation marks Veterans Day, we thank you for the courage and dedication of so many in the armed services who have guarded and defended us, even to the point of losing their lives. We ask you to preserve our nation and to bless all who serve in the armed forces. Let those soldiers who also trust in you find ongoing peace and security for their souls in your gospel. Gracious Father, we thank you for your gift of marriage through which you bring many blessings to your children here on earth. We praise you for giving Dale and Nancy Zastro 43 years of married life. You have shown them your grace and love in countless ways. You have been present in their marriage to bring your many blessings. Through their Christian companionship, they have loved, helped, and supported one another. Keep your hand of blessing over them and their Christian marriage. Graciously hear all of our prayers as we also pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you, the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.
we sing the closing hymn, you may be seated. May our Savior Jesus sustain us in the week ahead as we find great comfort in his gospel and use the gift that the Lord has given to us. A special welcome to guests. We invite you, as always, to come again to hear God's word here in our sanctuary. Between our services, we will have the voters' meeting in regard to the letter of intent from the YMCA. Because of the voters' meeting, there will not be adult Bible class or teen Bible class next Sunday. Those two classes will begin new topics. The adults will begin a study of prayer and the teens a study of angels and demons. We did receive news this past week as to a decision from Mr. Phil Gustafson, whom St. Luke's had called on behalf of TSL to serve as the next principal of our school. He has accepted that call to serve as future principal of TSL. We thank and we praise the Lord for leading to accept that call and We'll pray for him as he prepares throughout the remainder of the school year to serve here at our school beginning next year. God bless your day.